what I was asked to talk about was if I make it, does tech own it? Um, before we get into the answer to that question, if we ever do, uh, we should ask, uh, is it important to own what you have made? Uh, um, and, and first we should uh, decide what we need about, mean about ownership. I think what we need, what came here to talk about today is IP ownership. You know, the, having the, the patents or the copyrights, maybe even the trademarks in whatever technology, whatever creative expression, whatever work that you make. And, and so that's what we will be talking about. Uh, but you might be, you might want to consider that there are situations where you're working or you're researching or you're coming up with ideas or things to market uh, that, that aren't going to allow, aren't going to be patentable uh, for various reasons or that aren't going to be copyrightable. Or if they are, it, it doesn't make much difference if it's copyrightable. Uh, and so you still have the, the, you still have the right to do whatever you want to do, we hope. Uh, but you will have a non-exclusive ownership of whatever rights you have. And that's okay too. But today we're going we're gonna to uh, address situations where you are uh, getting the uh, entire bundle of rights, exclusive ownership. Uh, you all, I understand, are, are budding entrepreneurs. And um, you probably know more about the value of ownership than, than I would as a lawyer. Although I have to say, I, before I came to work here, I, I, for many years, was working with a lot of startup companies, mostly in the software industry, and, and have been uh, well acquainted with entrepreneurs and, and what it takes to make a company take off. Uh, and from my perspective, the value to having uh, exclusive ownership in the IP is in what you know raising capital because venture capitalists or angel investors or anybody else you can get to bring any money to the table is not going to want to invest in you if you, there's not something substantial they can they can have and usually it's the it's the issued patent or in some cases a copyright uh, and they will be more inclined to invest if that's the case also, you know, having exclusive ownership provides you with a marketing edge. You've got, you've got a product that nobody else has. And if they want that product with all its features, with all its uh, uh, benefits, they have to come to you. Or it can, can result in an increased profit margin. You can get more for whatever your invention or service is if you are the only person who can, can do it. So as I said, let's assume we're talking about exclusive ownership. So the question is, what you really want to know is, if I make it, will I own it? Not will tech own it, but will I own it? And I can tell you right now that I can very loyally uh, give you a definite maybe. And that's going to be that way every time the question is asked, maybe. What are the factors that go into determining whether you own the invention? Well, one, can the invention be owned by anyone? And I'll address this a little bit further as we go on. Uh, there's situations where no matter what technology, no matter what you claim about the technology or if you're the first with it, it can't be owned. Uh, second, will the law of patents or copyrights or trademarks or trade secret uh, allow you to claim exclusive rights in your invention or work? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. And then do the rules of the policies of the university own you, allow you to own an invention that's created? Um, and we'll talk about that uh, as well. Okay, so those are the three areas that we're going to address. First area was, can anyone own your invention? Is it possible to, to own it? Um, when I talk about ownership, I'm talking about the right to control the intellectual property in question. Uh, the, 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 the intellectual property that's embodied in your advice or your service or, or um, whatever. We're not talking about physical objects. We're talking about ownership of IP, the intellectual property. Um, Ownership of intellectual property can be had, uh, is only allowed or given to you uh, through uh, various parts of the law, like the law of patents or the law of copyright, the law of trade secrets, the law of, of uh, trademarks. Without that kind of, uh, uh, 
if you can't meet the standards for one of those laws, then you aren't going to have IP law. And there are certain, for, certain forms of intellectual property that the law will not allow you or anyone else to own, okay? Uh, this patent statute, the first section of the patent statute, uh, talks about whoever invents or discovers any new or useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new or useful improvement may obtain a patent. All right. This section here is, is probably one of the most controversial areas of the patent law today. And focus on the whoever invents any new in, uh, uh, machine manufacturer or composition of matter. The courts have, have said that this particular statute means that there are certain areas uh, of technology, there are certain areas of science, there are cer certain areas that are not eligible for patent protection. And it will not allow a claim to issue that, f that contains uh, a recitation uh, reference to the laws of nature or natural occurring things. You can't get a patent on the laws of nature. You can't get a patent on gravity and you can't get a patent on, on if you find, if you were to find some new mineral in the earth today uh, that nobody had seen in the history of man, you still couldn't get a patent on it because it's a natural occurring thing. You can't get a patent on living things uh, or things derived from living things. And this has been very, uh, um, very much in, in the law lately uh, with people trying to get, uh, um, trying to get patents on DNA sequences and, and using those for, uh, uh, as a means to, to um, do diagnosis for certain in, in illnesses. Uh, the courts have said, no, you can't do that. Uh, even if you've got a, a sequence, a DNA sequence that, uh, when you find it nine times out of ten, indicates that you're going to have a certain illness, that there are certain condition, uh, such as cancer, uh, you still can't get a patent on it because that is something that is uh, is a part of a living thing. Although you can get, you know, if you can get a patent if you genetically engineer some living form, if you were to take a uh, plasmid of, or take a uh, some kind of organism and put a plasmid that changes its character or causes it to do something else like all of a sudden you, you this this little organism has a desire to eat uh, petroleum uh, you can get a patent on that although today it may be harder than it was back when that patent was issued but for in general you can't get a patent on living things you can't get a patent on mathematical formulas and that of course includes algorithms unless you Unless you use your algorithm somehow in a combination with some other kind of device, uh, you cannot get a, a patent on a naked algorithm. And abstract ideas. And abstract ideas are, the, are what has uh, been in the forefront in the last year or so in the patent courts uh, because there has been a lot of claims of different business methods, different ways to do business. And, and um, the courts, rather than going, well, they go two ways on that. One we'll talk about in a bit. But they have said, no, uh, any, you know, even if you have some kind of formula to calculate risk on trading derivatives, uh, basically that's an uh, abstract idea. Uh, it's just a mathematical formula or an abstract idea. You cannot get a patent. So that could, uh, I know a lot of people are out there creating um, apps. You got an app for this and an app for that. And a lot of the apps are, are uh, related to matters that would fall under the idea of abstract ideas and, and in the end will not be patentable. So right off the bat, can I own it? You cannot own anything, any invention, or what you'd call invention, that falls under this first area. That is that the law of patent says no, it's not going to happen. Second, uh, Section 102B of the, the patent statute talks about uh, in no case does copyright protection uh, be afforded to uh, ideas or to devices, or not ideas, but to devices or to uh, services or whatever that are not novel. Um, 
And this means that if someone else has put on sale your invention, someone else has written about your invention, if you've written about your invention, if you have uh, uh, offered it for sale, uh, if it's been somewhere uh, in use uh, for more than a year prior to the time you file your patent, you are out of luck. You cannot have it because it will no longer be considered novel. And novelty reaches back a long ways. One of the things that we talked about before was the apps and, and how they're, um, uh, there's a lot of them that are not going to be granted any kind of patent protection. And, and part of the reason for that is that the kinds of things that are being done by the app, the steps that are being taken, the input, the output, or whatever, uh, is something that has been uh, in use or on sale for many, many years because all they did was take the same system that was being run on other platforms previously and incorporated into the app. And so, you know, by 102B, the, the, um, the novel, novelty, will not, um, novelty will not be there and you will not be able to get any kind of patent protection for it. Also, when you uh, try to obtain a patent, you, um, well, here's, the, here's the, some of the language that they use about novelty. And, um, and as I said, it, it knocks you out of the box on many different grounds. But finally, this last, the last sort of requirement for you to get a patent, or one of the last ones that's important for us today, uh, is obviousness. Um, and obviousness is, is kind of hard to explain, but basically what it says is that if you take an invention and you make the next step uh, to improve it, and that step would have been obvious to somebody who is, has ordinary skill in the art, you are no longer, it's no longer available for being patented. Because we're not going to give patent protection for things that are, are not um, novel or they don't advance the science. Patent protection is a monopoly. If you get a patent and you have a patent, you have the rights to control that IP. You have the rights to control who can make, who can sell, or can use that property for a period of 20 years from the time you filed your patent application. That's a very powerful monopoly. And in order to allow that monopoly, you, know, the, you have to jump through the hoops. And it can't be a trivial extension of whatever the art is at the time. It has to be something that is... Um, that is something that, that takes the, the state of the art uh, in sort of an inventive leap forward. And so obviousness is, is, is something that knocks out a lot of uh, inventions. And it's been, it, it besides the um, patentable, what, what is patentable subject matter that we talked about first, it is the hottest item in the patent law today because like, you know, uh, patentable subject matter, it, it'll, it, it's kind of, um, it can be kind of subjective as to what, what is obvious. I mean, what, what can you I mean? When you, have, when you have something that is novel, you can tell whether it's been on sale for a year. You can tell whether it's been in publication for more than a year. You can tell the standard is pretty cut and dried. But with obviousness, it's, it's very subjective. And so what would the state, what is the state of the art at the time the invention was made? And, and would it have been obvious to that person to take the next step? And that goes off. Um, like patentable subject matter and like what we talked about novelty, obviousness is also uh, knocks a lot of inventions out of the box. And, and as I said before about the, the apps that just merely port a, a function uh, from another platform onto a handheld device of some sort, um, it, it it will exclude those, the patentability of those devices or those apps because uh, it would have been obvious to the one skilled in the art to do that, to move it over to that particular platform. So, sum up, if you want to get a, a patent, uh, if you want to have ownership and through patent, this is, um, you have to jump through these hoops. It has to be something that's useful, obviously, uh, it has to be something that's, that's sub subject matter that's patentable. It has to be novel, and it has to be non-obvious. 
copyright uh, requirements for obtaining, uh, obtaining a copyright are, are a whole lot simpler. Um, you have to have a work that is expressive. Uh, and you have to have a work that is not only expressive, but it, it, it's minimally, minimally uh, creative. And, uh, and make sure that it's not a copy of another work. Okay, Very, very simple. Uh, the problem with the copyrights, the copyright law, is that it, it only protects your creative expression. It doesn't ex protect your scientific breakthrough or, or, or formula or something like that. It only protects the expressive part. And it has a very uh, low threshold for what, what, was it, what is an original. This gentleman back here is, is photographing what we're talking about here right now. If somebody else were to, and, he can, and, and it can be a copyrighted presentation. Uh, if somebody else were to come along and, and set a camera right next to him and take the same types of photographs, he too could get a copyright on their expression. Uh, it's, it's, it's that easy to, to have an original uh, for your, of your work. So as long as someone is not copying somebody else or is not substantially similar to somebody else, and that substantially similar doesn't apply to all forms of copyright, but uh, as long as those, item, those elements aren't present, then you can obtain a copyright. So, um, well, it's, 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 it's a lot easier to get the ownership depending on the kind of works that you want to protect. Um, okay, somehow or another, we've lost some slides. Does it look like a double trip to you? Hold on for one second. Yeah, sure. So he can get a copyright of the film that he's making. Someone next to him can get a copyright of the film he's making. Can right. copyright your image? Can he copyright my image? Yeah, I mean, um, right. he could copyright a photograph of my image. Um, he, he, he certainly can do that. Now, it, it's subject to, uh, in Tennessee, uh, we have a law that says that you are uh, your own personal image is protected for certain purposes. So if he were to take that image and try to use it to sell, and I don't know who would buy a picture of this, but if he were to take that and you know, try to sell it, he would need my permission to do that first, okay? That's just a part of, of what, the, uh, what is required for the privacy statute, not necessarily the copyright statute. If, if, if yeah, go ahead. I would, I would want to see it in writing. I mean, yes, you can make a contract and say, say that, you know, you can make a verbal contract, okay? But it's very difficult to, to prove, to enforce a contract that is verbal. So you should always try to have it in writing. Unless it's on video or something. That would be a recorded version, right. Yeah, writing, I guess, in this day and age is not the only way to, to do that. But yes, yeah, unless it's video or some other form of recordation. Well, I don't know what happened here, but let's just go on here. All right, so take you where we're, we, we, we talked about, we were gonna talk about three different things. One was that there's certain things that just can't be owned. Okay, we talked about that. We talked about patent and copyright very briefly, that you gotta, in order to get ownership, you gotta jump through certain hoops, and sometimes the hoops aren't always easy. We could go on for an hour or two about that, and I'd be happy to do so uh, whenever you um, want to. The final element here is, uh, do the rules of the university allow you to own an invention created at TTU? Okay. First, we'll start out, there's no Tennessee statute that controls the issue of ownership. Uh, any, any rules that come along are, are uh, somewhere outside of the Tennessee law. Um, 
the Bayh-Dole statute provides that uh, um, universities can own the inventions that the government pays for to have, you know, to have research work. They, they allow the university out to own it, uh, but they uh, require that the university pay a portion of the whatever royalties or whatever fees are generated by marketing that technology. They require um, uh, the, the inventors or inventor or inventors to get a certain portion of that money. And I think the, the by dole statute uh, envisions 30%, but you are lucky here, here at the at, at the place with deep pockets and big bucks, they will give you 50% uh, for your invention here, 50% of the royalties uh, gained here. But I'll talk about that after a little bit. Also, you should understand that, that both the uh, Copyright Act uh, under the uh, work for hire provisions of the Copyright Act and the patent statute both, both indicate that if you're an employee, okay, if you're an employee, uh, that the, your employer owns the invention. Uh, and so if you carry that forward to, to you, if, if any of you are working, some of you are faculty members, and, and of course, that whatever you do uh, as a faculty member belongs to the university. But students, if you are working in a student position, if you play in the university, you're working in a student position that requires you to work on these research projects, uh, you are an employee for that, for that reason as well, as we'll see here. And, and so you, um, your invention would be owned by the university. So just to that extent, um, we, we, the answer is pretty clear. If you're an employee and you're employed, employed working on this kind of material, you are going to, um, your invention is going to belong to, I just did some, your invention is going to belong to the university. Okay, the Tennessee Board of Regents and the university create policies uh, that dictate how the universities conduct its business. It's sort of the roadmap. It's like a statutory format. The, you, there's a lot of different policies. I don't know if you're aware of them, but those are the rules uh, for, uh, for, ah, thanks. <laughs> those are the rules um, that we all have to live by. Um, the applicable TTU policy is 15.0. TBR policy, and I don't know why they have all these numbers, 501, 06, 00, like we've got that many policies that we need to divide them up that bad. I have no idea why they do that. But, um, and if the two policies conflict in any way, or if there's, there's material that's not included in the TTU policy uh, that is in the uh, TBR policy, the TBR policy controls, yeah. Hmm. I would say, okay, we'll probably have weighed in on this as well, but I would say that if you are in a scholarship role that requires you to do the research and you're working under the supervision of some professor, that, that you are, for all intents and purposes, an employee. Um, if, what was the other, if you were just volunteering? Yeah. Well, hopefully the, your professor will have said, uh, as a part of volunteering here, uh, if you come up with anything and you, know, you assist in making uh, any invent invention here in my lab, that you will, uh, you will, that that invention will belong to the uh, university, and you will assign your rights to it to the university. And hopefully, they will have a little form that they would have you sign that would uh, indicate that that's the case. Hopefully, but it may not, and then we'll have to sit down and, and figure out how it, all, how it all works out. Okay. Okay, does the TTU policy apply to students? Here's the policy, okay? This policy, which is the policy on the ownership of intellectual property, shall apply when any one of the following three factors exist. The university sponsorship uh, of a project leading to the discovery or development of materials. Uh, Dr. Atunia here can tell you that the university spends a lot of money uh, sponsoring research that goes on around the campus, and when that happens, they expect that the, any, if any inventive 
work comes out of the money that is spent uh, on those projects, even ones you're volunteering for, uh, will belong to the university. Um, second, significant use of the university's personnel, facilities, services, or equipment, libraries excluded in the discovery or development process. Um, and you note down here the significant use is defined as significant use of facility services or equipment uh, that amount to $2,500 in 2001 dollars. So I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't make out the budgets for your, for your research, but I would think that that's probably a pretty low threshold. Dr. Tony, is that? No, it does evolve from the yeah. TDR policy. It's, it's exactly what, where it comes from. But, but I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that the threshold is fairly low. So most any project that you work on, if you're working on a lab with, with one of the instructors, uh, is probably going to qualify uh, as being university property. Uh, The electricity, floor space, yep. it all goes into the calculation. And as I was like, say, it's not very hard to get to $2,500, even if it's calculated in $2,001. <coughs> uh, so if we look at this policy, the answer is, is yes, the university does own the, if, if, if all of those criteria that we just looked at, accessibility, are, are met. Uh, and there are other policies that, just for your information, that do apply to students. <clears throat> if you are working for somebody on the outside and doing <coughs> research in the lab, you, uh, you have to make arrangements. In fact, we're in the process of doing that now for somebody. Uh, you have to make arrangements uh, as to how revenues will be split up and, and whatnot. Uh, if it, it may lead to development of intellectual property. Uh, four point four, um, it really requires you to follow the same rules that the faculty has to follow, and that is that that if you make an invention uh, that falls under section three, uh, if, if if it's going to be a university invention, you have to make a, a disclosure. Um, and you have to do it within a certain time frame. Uh, and, um, and once again, <laughs> it says right here, all faculty members teaching the courses in which students do work that can lead to patentable inventions should inform the students. Um, and, and really talked about the policy on patents and copyrights, and that's what I'm saying. They should, they should have a form that they would have you signed. People may think, well, I'm just a student. I, you know, how did I get into this? Well, uh, for whatever reason, the policy states that if you're going to be enrolled at the college, the university, uh, the, the uh, policy on ownership of intellectual property applies to students uh, enrolled at the TBR institutions. And the TBR policy is very similar to what is uh, what you have here uh, in that it, it talks about intellectual property developed within this person's scope of employment or developed in the course of a project sponsored by, this, by the institution, significant use of resources, we just talked about that, and, and developed in the course of a project arranged and controlled by the institution and sponsored by persons, agencies, and organizations external to the institution. This is even broader than the, than the, the, the um, language in the TTU policy. And so I would say that if it came down to it, this is, the, this is the policy that would apply to whatever work you're doing in the, uh, at, at the labs and, and, or in the classrooms here at TTU. And you know, once again, significant use is defined in this policy. Uh, similarly to, um, similarly to uh, what you saw in the TTU policy. Lou, I have a Go ahead. question on that last, do, 
or do you want to take questions? No, go ahead. I, we can do anything. So if I looked at the, um, that last point eight uh, on that, so it said if a student is conducting if they're, um, okay. maybe I should name it. No, 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 it's fine to hear. So <coughs> item 4A. Yeah. So if a student is doing an activity um, under the typical course Requirements. Right. Um, then it, it, I'm reading it to say that the type of things that they'd be doing in a normal course, participating in a lab, doing this on in labs, those things would not be considered significant. Right. right. And and I read I read it somewhat the same, and and and, and I read it that way. And um, I would put uh, uh, emphasis on the word typically available. The students, you know, it, if you're if you're talking about something that, that leads to an invention, that that is it contains valuable intellectual property, <clears throat> it's probably not the kind of thing that happens in a typical classroom or the typical lab, or you know, and and this is in there I think to say that that um, if if the student is you know because of your you know gets inspired by some of the things you said and goes home and does something or goes over to the library and starts sketching things out or, or get, gets the computer in the computer lab and starts entering in data, um, that's not going to you know, weigh against the, the, the student. The student could then still claim that invention. So, and I read this claim to say that perhaps they were in a dynamics and machinery class and the subject matter was related to dynamics and machinery, but if they were doing that class as part of their normal classwork, then that wouldn't, that wouldn't be counted as significant even though maybe the underlying Right, I think that that's right. I think it's probably too hard to sort out the the uh, the difference there. To, so they, we've erred in in the, in the side of saying, okay, students uh, should have some protection here. If we make them go to these classes, you know, we can't hold that against them when it comes to this inventive stuff. But I think if you read all the things on top of that, the one through four, it's still pretty hard to, you know, it it. Students are you, you. You you've really got to be the, the sort of the lone wolf in this thing to to make it make it work as far as being strict purely the students' IP. Yes, and that's true because I work with a lot of the students and host a lot of events, and Steve and I do a class together. And the average student, so that's what I would like to get clarified. The average student has walked away with this policy thinking. That if I invent a computer program in my dorm room, tech owns it. And I think that's the standard line of thought with most students. Um, that's kind of, kind of what I find to be their thought, which is just not true. You know, just because they invented something while they're in their dorm room doesn't mean the university has any claim to the right. Well, you know. I mean, you think you're presenting something that's right on the edge there, because I, I would say, if if they invented in their dorm room and it wasn't a part of some project that was going on in one of the instructor's labs, or or didn't require them to have all, uh, access to specialized equipment, exactly. or or that sort of thing, yeah. then I think that student would own it. Yeah, um, that's my point. And, they kind of think they're a engineering major and they do a phone app. They think that the school owns the rights to. Oh, and yeah. Which is just not true. No, no, I. It would be the same as Holiday Inn saying they own the right to anything that, that you did while you were staying at a Holiday Inn. So, but the students kind of have that mental picture. Yeah, no. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I got my question there. No, I, I think unless you meet some of the other criteria here, you're not going to, it would be yours. The reason why I spent some time in the first two sections about it had nothing to do with what the TTU policy is. I spent the time in the first two sections to show you you may not fall under the TP, TTU umbrella that, that they take it, but you still may not have anything that's of value because you can't get a patent for it or 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 you know I mean it, it'd be valuable but it would be it would be one of those things that's non exclusive the non exclusive use, I guess is what I was saying. So so you need all the things in combination with each other in order to, to get the, the sort of the exclusive use. Yes. Sorry, Lou, we're, we're wearing you down. No, no, that's fine. Okay. So I, I didn't have anything to say our, anyway. So well, that's I mean. good. Well, for our engineering students then, so a couple of typical places would be, in my mind, item two and then 4A. So let's say they were in a class uh -huh. where they had to do a class project. Right. Um, so that looks like it's the first part of 2A. 
or first part of two. So they develop a project as part of a course, but then you have sponsored by the institution. So in one case, they, they receive some money maybe from the institution to, to do that, or it's funded from a project outside. Right. I, in that case, it would clearly, they would have to go through the policy, right? But then what if they had a project that was assigned, but they did not receive any money other than would fall into 4A? I, I still think that if, if they're in a class mm -hmm. where there's an outside sponsored research project going on, whether it's a capstone project or whether it's a regular project, that I, I believe that the, the, the whatever intellectual property is generated out of that project is, is the university's so, property. So if, if they either were funded from an outside company through the university or right. if they received any, I would say, any money from the school that they could direct the spending of, you know, like a budget of $500. Right, then, right. And that would fall under two, where it's the sponsorship. And then the second type of project is they could have an assignment where they don't receive any type of support. They could say, they could be given a, like, write a program, you know, that you'll get graded on. Right. And they don't receive anything outside of 4A. Right, right. Um, in that case, it seems to me like it would read, start to read part two, but they don't receive sponsorship. Right. Other than what's called out in 4A. Right. I think that that situation where they, we're in a class and given an assignment, and the assignment triggered something in their own mind about how to create some valuable intellectual property that would belong to the student, because uh, they're not receiving any. They're not doing it as a part of sponsored research for the university. They're doing it on their really on their own or through the the class, uh, the typical class situ setting situation. Yes. Okay. I mean, I can I can see we're falling. I think probably the, that would fall more into the the copyright area arena. You know, somebody outside wants to make you know a, a, a film uh, of some sort or or do some. You know, we have some of the campuses are very active doing re student recordings, um, and um, typically, if if depends on how you read number three. Uh, Developed with the significant use of the institution's facilities, uh, you know that would really play a part of it. If you have to go into the the video or the recording studio to make all this happen, um, well, I take all that back. I take all that back because we have a policy that says that those would be the TBR policy exempts musical uh, exempts musical uh, creations, huh? An engineering club. Well, again, go back to three, you know, are you using significant, significant resources of the university? If not, then I, you know, think you know, it's, it's yours. You, you know, you got together, you put the brainstorm, you made this happen, and it belongs to you. Yeah. So, I'll ask the, long, the longer question. So, is this disclosed to students when they come to the university? Of course, we expect all the students to sit down and read all the policies when they arrive on yeah, campus. Absolutely. That's, that's <laughs> one of the first things we hope they all do. Um, the, the, responsibility of the, faculty. the faculty member who has these people in the labs that are doing these things are supposed to supposed to tell the students that that, that this policy is out there and and that uh, and that they should uh, be aware of the potential right to assign any inventions to the university. Probably. Most of the time it doesn't happen, but probably we live in a world where most of the time we don't have great inventions coming that way anyway. I don't know if anybody's aware of anything that's come out of tech. I'm not aware of it, but maybe it has. I can't think of any of the other schools that have either. Yes? Well, I'm just wondering, so if they did wander into this space where they somehow got paid or whatever, are they treated like employees? Do they go through the patents, like, you know, disclosed to the university, it goes through the patent committee? And my understanding is the committee can choose to either support that patent or give it back to the student. Correct. Exactly. And then if it goes to the patent committee and they choose to support it, it means they pay for the, um, for the patent, or they don't, according to the students, that they could keep it and not pay for it. That that's right. They keep. If, if it comes through and there are royalties generated, and yes. a student falls under the university owns it business, right. do they get 50% like yes. the faculty would? Yes, they get exactly the same as the faculty would. So you either get 100% or 50%. Okay. 
<laughs> but, you know, and here. It's not like they're completely cutting you out, is my right? They're not completely cutting it out. Plus, you know, um, uh, where, here's what you're talking about. The president can decide whether or not to exercise ownership in the, the patent, okay? And it, it, there is a committee on campus. Dr. Tunia heads it up. Uh, and a, you, you disclose your invention in a form that's out there available on the website. Uh, and, and it goes in front of the committee, and they decide whether or not to pursue the patent or the copyright or whatever protection you would have for your particular intellectual property. And if they decide they don't want to do it, then as you say, the president can sign a waiver and assign it back to the student. The student can then make the decision about whether or not to go forward with protecting the intellectual property. Okay? There are some benefits to having the university do it. And the first one is that the university will pay for the patenting and copyright costs and assume the risk that the patent will not get through the patent office. That's about a $10,000 risk. So if you're thinking about your invention, and you probably are, you know, probably, maybe some of you are wealthy beyond my wildest dreams, but probably not, and you probably don't have the money to lay out to file for the patent. And while you can, as an individual inventor, file your own patent in your own name, I don't advise it, because they'll chew you up. Uh, so you, that means you're going to have to go out and find a patent attorney, and it generally costs somewhere between six and ten thousand dollars to uh, get the patent, and you can figure mostly the closer to the ten. And you will get some advice about whether or not something is patentable. We we run searches for on, on most of the uh, technology that comes out of the uh, patent and technology committee. We run a, a novelty search, we, we, we try to find out what else is out there that is like this particular invention so that we can make an evaluation prior to filing the, the application. Uh, we can make an evaluation as to whether or not it's novel and whether or not we're going to have su substantial uh, uh, obviousness problems. And so that saves a lot of effort and a lot of uh, um, cost on your part. And the university will help market the, and the license or the, to the invention. Uh, I have to admit, we're not really great at that at this point. We're trying to get better, but 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 uh, you know, we're in the, right now in sort of this uh, stage where something's better than nothing. Uh, but we well, hopefully will be better than that soon. Uh, and the university will pay you 50 percent of what it receives in net revenues from your invention. Net revenues means they deduct the cost of the patent. And they deduct the uh, any kind of marketing costs, which are really de minimis at this point, uh, before you get paid. So those are those are reasons why you uh, may want to say, you know what, university, you can be the owner of my invention, uh, and go from there. I want to tell you too, the the patent, the 50% is is what is divided between all the inventors. If there's only one inventor, they get the whole 50%. If there's more than one they have to agree upon who gets what percentage of that 50%. Let's see what we missed here. And I touched something again, and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it that I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Things that they it, might respond to they don't want to do more. In fact, we would actively encourage that sort of thing because I think that the more, you know, the, the people who are involved in a spin-off are probably better suited to to go out and do that than than yeah, than the university. Uh, okay, so what does all this mean? Well, to turn if you hold the ownership, you need to do a factual and legal analysis based on the points that we've talked about here to find out whether or not you've got anything that you actually own. Uh, like legal talk. 
<laughs> it is. I mean, that's what I said. It's just the first slide said maybe. <laughs> I said maybe. I mean, there's all these factors that play into it, and well, I and, think you're helping us, though. You're helping yeah. us, and so. you have to you sort through all the factors. But but uh, um, that that's what it takes to to own something. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we will do that. Okay. If it's if if it's a uh, freelancer who um, is creating something in, in the copyright arena, we would want to have them sign a work for hire agreement, uh, which is a specific agreement we need to have this, which unfortunately doesn't cover every every kind of work, uh, and we would have them assign assignment agreement, sort of a double whammy to try and, and get the ownership. For for the patent. We would try to enter into some some sort of agreement uh, about who would own the rights, whether they would be jointly owned or whether they would be solely owned by the university, and we do it both ways depending on the circumstances. Um, sometimes you bring somebody in, and it wouldn't be as a freelancer, but somebody will come to the university and say, "We need your research talents, or we need the skills of Dr. X to be able to solve this problem," and we're bringing this to the table as far as our IP ownership, and we know that there's going to be other IP created during the course of this project. So how about if I own everything that I had before I saw you, you own everything you had before you saw me, and everything we put together, uh, invent together, we will jointly own it. And that's the way it most, almost all of those things work. There are some outside sponsors who say, no, I got to have it all. You know, I'm just hiring this guy to, to, to gal to be a uh, um, researcher like I would if I hire an employee and so I got to have it all. So it goes both ways but we particularly would want to have it in a joint ownership situation if we could.